And so here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to have a conversation around. I want to point out something that I'm struggling with a bit, and, and maybe you're struggling with it just a little bit as well. Here's what I mean. As I grew up, I, I think I had a more optimistic view of the culture and the world around us. I, I think as a kid, and you can call it naive or you just didn't know about her, but as I was growing up, I, I would think the best of my governing officials. I would think the best of the world around me, of the education system, of the political system. Here's the tension that I face today that's different for me. And unfortunately, it's different because I'm raising four children now. They're not growing up with the same optimistic view that I had as a child. And it's unfortunate. Something is shifting inside of our culture. You've seen it. Let's give it a title for just a minute. Let's call it this. There's something occurring right in front of us that's happening that's very divisive. And I'm going to call it the great divide over the next couple of minutes. And here, here's the challenge. Here's what I don't like. Here's where I feel forced. So I feel backed into a corner. I feel like I'm being forced between two options that I don't always like either one of them. I, I feel like in this divide, you're forcing me into a camp. And by putting me in this camp, that means others are in different camps. And that means I'm separated from you. Something's happening in this great divide, and it's happening right in front of us, and we're being forced to take sides, and here's the problem. What is this great divide producing? What is this polarization leading to? Well, here's what I see is happening in front of us. Is, is we, my friends, are, are coming to these places where we're being torn apart. So let me just show you something for just a moment. Think about this idea that you and I are being forced to choose between red and blue. Which one will you do? You and I are forced between conservative and liberal. Choose a camp. You and I are being torn from the top as government rips us apart. Something's happening within this great divide that's tearing us apart, not just in government, but something much closer to home see something's happening within our community that I'm told, oh, this is a white issue. Oh, that's a black issue. That's a brown issue. You and I are being pitched an idea that says you should be divided by the color of the skin. Something's happening within our culture. And the reason that this is provoking me is because over the last handful of years, we've seen this great divide be amplified. You just backtrack over the last couple of years and watch the division on mask, no mask, relationship, no relationship. This is an unfortunate one because we're being pitched this idea and it has hit my home and my heart. Within the last few years, this idea of the great divide and us being torn apart within community Years I spent in relationship with a brother of another skin color than my own. Years we broke bread. Years we looked at scripture. And then we went into this season. And a great divide become knocking on my door. And entered into between relationships that I held close to me. Racial tension separated me and my friend. A church member. A colleague something would happen and is happening right in front of us this we're being torn apart and it's not just my community it's real close to home it's my neighbors you see let me just find out that my neighbor is fill in the blank something different than me something different than you let me just find out that my neighbor is and watch the divide begin to grow <laughs> See, in all of this that we and I have been facing, you and I have been facing in this great divide, this tension that continues to grow over the last few years, something's been happening as we've been torn apart. I watched my neighbor. I watched my neighbor here recently in the political campaign go and state her own viewpoint and post signs outside of my neighborhood. And I watched as the rest of my Neighbors who said, we're for you, we love you, we support each other. I watched them rip each other apart on Facebook, 
on the internet. I'll tear you down. Know your place. I've watched this tension begin to grow and it seems as if there's this great divide. And when I look at it closely, my friend, it's coming between our friends. Something's happening because you do what I do, boo. You go on Instagram and you're scrolling. Hey, Jacqueline, come, 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 come. can you believe what they believe? Somebody believes something different than me, believes something different than you. There's immediately a division, a wall that goes up between us. We are torn apart. Something's happening even in our friendships. Things that used to not separate us. Things that I wouldn't even know about you are now so in front of my face that now I can't help but disagree with you. Be divided from you. There's a great divide that's happening in our culture today. It should be concerning. It should be alarming. Your antennas should be going off. Something's happening as we're being torn apart because it goes community and family. Here's what's happening is we're divided over the dinner table. I have conversations with some of you and you tell me about some of your children who are in different viewpoints. We're arguing over. Can you believe what we're arguing over? Male, female our sexualities, our identities. I'm backed into a corner and I'm being forced to choose which camp I'm gonna sit in and I'm being divided between even my family members. And this grows attention. It should produce something within us that is unsettled. It's one thing for it to be a pervasive division within the culture around us. Listen, I expect the world to behave like the world, but here's the problem. Here's what's happening. There's a great divide that's happening within the Christian church. You don't believe me? Ask the United or not so United Methodist Church. Brothers, I love you. We within the Christian faith can't even agree with each other. And now we're to the position where we're tearing things apart and we're divided. My friends, this division that we are facing, this idea, this mantra, this thing that we are adopting, it's communicating something. It's saying something. It's doing something. You and I are facing a great divide where we indeed are seeing things be torn apart. And here's what I'm going to argue. Here's what I want to show you. Here's what I want to convince you of over the next couple of minutes that my issue the greatest tension that I face is not actually between you and I what divides us. There's actually something going on behind the scenes. There's a bigger picture. There's something happening that we don't see here, but it's unfolding in front of us. Something is happening as we're being torn apart and it doesn't require you to put on a tinfoil hat. You and I are facing a great divide. There's a tension in front of us. And here's what I want you to see. Here's what I'm going to argue over the next couple of minutes. Here's what I want you to see is that when the world is divided, yet the church remains united, there's a byproduct. Something happens as a result. The love of Christ is ignited. When the world is divided, but the church remains united, the love of Christ becomes ignited. I want to show you over the next couple of minutes how even Jesus himself how he would see into a moment what you and I face today, thousands of years later, and he would do something. Jesus would begin to pray about what you and I face today. Jesus would pray about what you and I face today. And what's interesting as we lean into this in John chapter 17 is Jesus has a prayer request. Isn't that weird? Like, you know, I'm full of prayer requests. God, help me, help me, help me. But Jesus, God in the flesh, in John chapter 17, he's going to slow down and he's going to begin to pray something that is so powerful. If you would adopt it, if I could begin to apply it into my heart and in my life, if you would get a hold of it, if somehow we could become the epitome, the answer to the prayer that Jesus prays, then it changes everything for me. Then it'll change everything for you. And it is the antidote 
for what is happening in the great divide of the culture around us. I want to show you this prayer that Jesus would pray. And this is in John chapter 17. It's as if Jesus foreknew. It's as if he saw, as if he recognized this tension that would be here. He begins to lean into this prayer. He begins to set this idea. He's near the end of his life. He's brought his disciples close to him as we talked about last week. He's in this idea that it would be better for me to go away. Transition is coming. And he's praying from a place of transition. In John chapter 17, Jesus is talking to his heavenly father. We're going to read several of it, but only you see this in verse one. As Jesus said this, he looks towards heaven and he prays. He begins to open up his mouth and speak to his heavenly father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that you might glorify, that I might glorify you. This honor and love relationship is symbiotic. And he begins to pray, Father, he moves on through several verses. And then in verse nine, you're going to see this watch. He says, I am praying for them. I'm praying for the believers. I'm not praying for the world, which is interesting. And Jesus in this moment, at the very end of it all, he's going to see something. He's going to see a problem that you and I face today in the great divide. And he's going to say, hey, this thing, I'm not praying about everything else that's happening out there, the division that's happening out there. I have a specific prayer that I'm praying for them, for those who are inside. And so as we present this, he's praying for me and he's praying for you. Watch this. I'm not praying for everybody out in the world, but I am praying for those that you have given me for they are yours, God. They belong to you. He's going to go in verse 12 and he says this. He says, when I was with them, I kept them. Watch this. Watch the verbiage. Watch the heart of a shepherd be revealed. And Jesus loves his people so much that he says, God, I know my time here is coming short. I know I've got to come back to you, but, but God, I'm praying for one thing. I love them so deeply and so dearly. While I was here, God, I did everything I could to keep them, to guard them, to protect them. I was the shepherd. I was the gatekeeper. Everything I could. Heavenly Father, here's my prayer. As I was doing that, not one of them has been lost, has been divided, has been cut off from us, except that one. Even with Jesus, there would still be a division that would take place. Something happens here as he goes on, and he says this. He says in verse 7, 13, 17, 13, he says, But now I'm coming to you, Father, I'm coming back, and I pray these things into the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14, watch this, and this becomes so important. This is part of the conversation we've been having recently as a church. Watch this in 14. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because even when the church exists in its fullness, in its best, there's a division between the world and the church. This isn't the division that we're discussing. There, there's a division within the church body. So just for distinction, as we're talking about unity, we're talking about within the faith, within the church, something is happening here that the world would hate the church, the people of the church, because they are not from here. They do things differently. They think differently. They've been transformed. They've been renewed. They have a different way of seeing things. And so as we see this idea begin to play out, verse 15, his prayer, watch as his prayer for us unfolds. He says this, he says, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. And this becomes the great idea here. And just, he begins to paint this idea that I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, but I'm asking you to protect them while they're in it. Inside of this is an idea that they are citizens of another kingdom. If you know, you know. They are citizens of heaven. And what he's saying here is that he's not asking God to begin to take them out of the kingdom that they're in, but there's actually something significant. Do you want to know why when you became a Christian, if you're a Christ follower here, that he didn't beam you up, Scotty, and take you back? 
is because there was something for you here. Jesus, at the end of his time, is not praying, God, as I go away, I love them so much, let them come with me. That is not his prayer. God, I am placing them. I have planted them. I have set them into this world. God, I'm not asking you to take them out. My heart is that you protect them that you would keep them together, that you would unify them, that you would not let something come in and divide them to separate them. God begins to lay out this prayer through Jesus. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you to keep them from, and we'll come back to this. I'm asking you to protect them, to keep them from the evil one. Then we get to hear the heart of Jesus's prayer that he says this to us. He says, they're not of this world, just as I am not of this world. And then in verse 20, watch this prayer. This is where he begins to bring it all together. This is when the heart of the prayer is unfolded. Jesus prays, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message, all of them. Now, you don't read this and immediately see the tensions because you weren't in the culture that happened then. But for a statement like this to be made from a Jewish rabbi that somehow would be inclusive enough that it would speak against the division that had happened during that day and it would actually be that in the kingdom of God there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is only believer. Something happens here. He begins to speak to this idea, no Jews, no Gentiles, it's not Romans or Samaritans, it's not men versus women. These wouldn't be the divisions between free and slave Something would happen in the kingdom of God, even from its onset, that would provoke a tension between the world and the kingdom. There would always be division between church and the kingdom, but it cannot be, it should not be within the church itself. He says, I'm praying for all of them. And he goes on and he says, those who believe in me through their message. Verse 21, the specific word, and this is for us today. This is what he prays. John 17, 21. Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. God, they have purpose here. There's something that they need to be about, something that they need to be doing. God, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. I'm asking you to, I'm asking you to protect them in a certain kind of way, God. Don't let the enemy come in there and bring division Here's what I want you to do instead, God. Here's my prayer. Heavenly Father, here it is. What's the word? What's the word? One. That all of them, go back one. Not literally this. For all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And this, my friend, is a really powerful idea. Think about this for just a moment. He's been laying out this whole prayer from the beginning of John chapter 17, and he's been talking to his heavenly father. He's been talking about their honor for each other, their love for each other, the way that they serve each other, point towards each other. And then he's going to begin to paint this picture. It's it's as if he is saying, you know what, father, that they might be one just as the Trinity is one. And this is beautiful, isn't it? Because the Trinity is many parts, but one. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Different distinctions, different roles, but one God. The church. Many parts. One body. Some of the hands, some of the feet, but we are indeed one. Jesus is praying something that we see unfolded throughout scripture that we would be one. The church is to be one. Jesus prayed that we would be one. And it is to be a picture of the Trinity. It's the same depth that you and I would be one, that there is no distinction. There is no separation. There is no division between them. Yes, they're different. They talk different, walk different, have different functional roles, but something happens when we become one just as he is one. So let me paraphrase. This is what he's praying. This is what he's saying. Father, let me just simplify this. Father, make us one. This is the prayer. This is what Jesus prays over us. And look, let's begin to contrast this a little bit with what's happening in culture today. Jesus prays something, and if I'm honest with you, when he prays it, it feels like it's impossible. 
It, it doesn't feel like with all of the things that could separate us, with your opinion and your perspective being different than mine, with my background and your background, with my socioeconomic status and your amount of money in the bank, with your upbringing and education versus mine, something along the way, it's too easy to separate ourselves, to allow little petty things, little relational things to come in and divide and conquer and separate. Something happens. It seems impossible. But Jesus begins to pray this idea, and, and it somehow goes from impossible to imperative. Jesus prays something and would not have prayed it if it had not been possible for you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, to be united, not divided, as one. Something happens, and so what we see along this way is, what if, as Jesus prays, Father, make them one? Here's my question for you. Tim, what if we could be the answer to that prayer? What if you and I could be? What if the church could be? What would happen in the day and age that we find ourselves in when there is a great divide in the culture amongst us? What would happen if a group of people would begin to rally around and be united? What would happen? See, Jesus set out from the very beginning. I want to show you a few things because this becomes the question for us. This becomes a defining idea of who we are as a church. We are one church. From the very beginning that the New Testament church, when it was set in motion and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that it was one church. It wasn't, oh, by the way, the denominational church that you like and you go and sit up under and then another denomination and another. There was a central church underneath the message of Jesus Christ. And in that central church, they were of one heart. What was it that united them together? When the world would want to divide them, when everything would want to separate them, when culture comes knocking and tries to tear you apart, what would they cling to? What would hold them together? No, it wasn't going to be their skin color. It wasn't going to be the amount of money that they would have in the bank. What was it that was going to hold them together? How could the early church become the answer to Jesus' prayer that they would have one heart? We see this in the very beginning in Acts chapter 2. We looked at this last week. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of Pentecost and the power that came with it. We looked at this. Look at, look at how they were one. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart. And so, and no individual said that any of these things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common, everything in common. They had what mattered in common. They were from all other parts of the area and region. They even spoke different languages. They would have different backgrounds, but yet they had everything in common. What did they have in common? They had one heart. What would be the thing that you would unite them together in the early church that they would get right? They would have one heart, but then there was something else. It would say this, in this one heart, they would give one command. One heart, one command. You know this one. A new commandment I give you, love one another. In relationship with each other. Look, I know that you're not always going to agree with each other. I know that. But can you love each other without being in agreement with each other? Is it possible? It has to be possible because the New Testament tells us and commands us it's an imperative that you and I would love one another. They were under this common ground, this common umbrella, this thing that you would unite them together. Well, they had a common heart and they had a common command and they would have one. And this is important is they would have one enemy. They would have a common enemy. And this was so important, and you've read this scripture before, but there is such a thing. The New Testament author Peter, he says to us to be sober-minded, to be watchful. <clears throat> be alert, be aware. Your adversary, the devil, uh, watch this whole thing. He roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he could devour. Watch the next verse. Ephesians 6 and 12 says this. So, we have an adversary, he's roaming around, he's looking to cause problems. Then this helps us to see our common enemy. 
For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. There's something happening behind the scenes today, and it's that the devil is at play. Call me tinfoil hat if you want. I want to show you oftentimes what we feel on the other side of division when rage and hatred rolls up in your heart for another group of people and you somehow have been told that it is that thing that divides you and cannot be conquered. It will forever separate you. This is what you've been told. This is what we are peddled. This is a part of a great divide that's happening in front of us on our watch. There is an enemy, a puppet master. There is one who is pulling strings in high places of authority. Jesus tells us that this thing that you and I are experiencing here in flesh and blood is not all there is. There is more to be seen than what I see with my eye. Something is happening in the spiritual realm around us. And I am arguing with you. And scripture is showing you this, that it is behind a great divide. I believe that there is an agenda behind some of the division that is being caused in the world around us today. I believe, and I'm not pointing fingers at political leaders. I am not pointing fingers at any individual inside of our culture. I'm pointing every finger I have at this idea. There is something going Cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil, authorities, influence. And I believe it's such an agenda. And do you know why I'm convinced? Is because the devil knows what you may have forgotten. The devil knows a truth and therefore he lies. The devil knows this truth. Watch this. <laughs> If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. What is the greatest tactic that we know from just military tra tactics? Divide and conquer, baby. Separate and annihilate. If I can somehow divide you within the church and I can pull you out and I can pit you against another one, Oh, you're in the devil's sandbox. There is a lion roaming around on the savannah trying to take you out, trying to find as he prowls. And what happens is he's trying to divide from the top down. He has convinced the world that there are two political parties and you should sit in this camp and hate everybody else. He has convinced the world on the community that we have today that you're to isolate yourself from everybody else, be separated, be divided. Look out for you, boo. This is the idea that's being peddled to us. And we are a divided people more today than we ever have been in history. This is concerning because I'm a father. This is concerning because it impacts the next generation. This is concerning because it's happening on our watch, church. This is concerning because it is the opposite of what my Lord Jesus Christ prayed. Father, make them one. I know. I'm convinced there is an enemy roaming around at this moment. Pulling strings, orchestrating things so that you and I will hate each other. Divide and conquer, simple. We forget that this is what's happening. And instead of pointing at him, we point at each other. Jesus knew this and invites us to be better, to do better. And he would pray that you and I might be one. The question for us is, can we be the answer to that? And what would happen? What would it look like? One church, one enemy, one heart, 
Watch this. I have one purpose. You can give me this one, Lynn. One purpose. When they would unite together, when they would realize that, yes, we have this common enemy, but he would remain in his place as long as we are in unity, we don't even have to focus on that. What we can be about is the things that do unite us. Yes, we have one enemy, but we have one calling, one commandment, one mission, one purpose. This is what happens when he begins to point us in the direction that we are to go, to go, therefore, in all the world and make disciples. This becomes the calling for us, the purpose. This is what unites the church. So many of us are torn and separated in this great divide. Something is happening behind the scenes, but what will you and I do? What do we do? Early church got this right until they didn't. Something would begin to happen, and Paul would speak into it in 1 Corinthians. This is what he says here, and I want to just borrow this language. He says, for it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling amongst you. There's division. There's fighting. There's, there's something between you. Verse 12, what I mean is some of you are saying, you know, follow Paul or Apollos. Or some of us are following Cephas. There's division that's happening. Even in the early church, Jesus has just ascended. He's just prayed it. They've just been of one heart and gave everything to each other. Flip the pages just, man, now they're already divisive. The enemy has already come into the camp and they're separated. And Paul speaks into this and he says this, and this verse he says, is Christ, is he torn? Is he separated? Now he's asking a rhetorical question, but you and I should ask this, is he? Paul's laying out this question here, and, and this is what happens. If, if that's the case, if he's not torn and he's supposed to be united, this is what Paul says that we're supposed to do in Ephesians. There's another church. First it was the church of Corinth, now it's the church of Ephesus. They've got the same problem, the same problem that you and I face. Here's what happens. I, therefore, Paul would say, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have called. He goes on and he says, with all humility and gentleness and with patience and bearing with one another in love. And in verse three, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace, eager to maintain, eager to maintain. I like the way the NIV says it this way. It says, make every effort, eager to maintain, make every effort, eager to maintain, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Something would happen. Jesus would pray about it, make them one. Paul would see that it wasn't always the case that division would come even into the church. There would be temptations to let division and beliefs and backbiting and gossip and slander. This would happen throughout the New Testament. What happens here is he begins to tell them what to do to make every effort to be intentional. As much as it is up to you, be a peacemaker, a peace seeker. As much as it's up to you, reconcile relationship, make every effort. Oh, what we're not saying on any of this, in case you missed it, just to clarify, we're not saying that because we're supposed to be united, it means that you're going to conform. It's been said before, uniformity is not conformity. I think it's close to that. <laughs> you get where I'm going. Look, you be you, but we can still be one. That's the beauty of the body of Christ, isn't it? So that's what happens here inside of scripture. We're also not saying that you can't have an opinion that's different than somebody you're sitting next to today. Trust me, you probably have an opinion, lots of opinions different than your neighbor you're sitting next to. I'm not saying that we're all going to agree, but what we must do is refuse to let the devil have his way to divide us, to somehow separate us. Why? Because here's what Ephesians reminds us. That we are one church. And why are we one church? Because there's one body. There's one spirit. Just as if you're called to one hope belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The calling that you and I have as Christians is to be a part of a community that's diverse in its nature and its giftings, but one. We are one church. 
here's what I want you to see. As citizens of an eternal kingdom, why? Why would we let something temporal divide us? Why would we, if we truly are citizens of another kingdom, if we are an eternal people, why would we allow something so temporary in nature to come and split us apart? The challenge for you and I is to be united as one, to stand together in the things that hold us as one. We have one God, one purpose, one way to the Father. We have one Savior. I don't need my skin color to unite us. I don't need the amount of money that we share or don't share to unite us. There is something deeper more profound than even the blood that flows through my family's veins. We are united in Christ, brothers and sisters for eternity. This is the question. Why would we allow ourselves to be divided over temporary issues? We can disagree, yet love in unconditionally. And so Jesus' prayer was, Father, make them one. And I want to encourage us, I want to ask us to be able to pray that today. And I want you to see that if we would pray this, if we would believe this, if we would act this out, there's something that happens as a direct result. It's always been true, and it's true today as well. Here's what would happen if we become the answer to Jesus' prayer. He says this in verse 21. He says, Father, may they also be in us so that. Let me give you the reason. Here's what he says. So that those in the world may believe that you have sent me. Here's the idea. Here's the picture. Is that when you and I are united together, this is what we show the world. No, I don't mean blonde hair, blue eye, Jesus. You understand. But I do mean that when you and I are united together, that they would see, that they would believe, that those who are looking inward, that they would know that the love of Christ is within us and they would see the picture of Jesus. Look at verse 23 here. It says it in this way, 22. I have given them the glory that you gave to me that they may be one as we are one. And then in verse 23, in them, I in them and you in me so they may be complete unity. Look how beautiful this is written. I and them and you and me that so that they may be brought to complete unity. This is the picture. This is Jesus's prayer that you and I might be in complete unity with one another, loving each other, supporting each other. I've got your back. You've got my back. We stand underneath the same umbrella that unites us together. When the world is divided, yet the church remains united. Scripture shows us that the love of Christ is ignited. That those around who are looking in, they need to see something authentic, something real, something that's not backbiting, something that's not dividing. And so today we're praying, Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can influence many. Make us one, God. Bring us together as a church with one voice, with one worship, under one name. God, and when we do that, can we influence many? Can others see your goodness? Can others see your glory? Lord, make us one. The band's going to come. We're going to pray. Here's what I would like for us to do. Here's what I'm convinced of. If you and I would stand together, even when we disagree, if we would somehow put our love for one another over our opinions, if we would somehow be reminded that it is the love of Christ that unites us, the Holy Spirit of God within us, then this reduces backbiting, slander. This reduces all of the things that the outside world looks into a church and says, I don't want that. But if we love each other, we support each other, we cover each other, what would it say to the world around us? I'd love to pray for us today. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that you love us enough 
Father, that you don't just leave us to be divided and separated from you. If you're in the room today and you feel like you're divided from God, you feel like maybe something has separated you from him, and here's what I've discovered after a number of years. We're going to pray, but I want you to see this, but this is the next one up here for me. Is that people that are divided long to be united. This is, this is what I've seen to be true over and over again. If you've been divided, if your heart has been separated from God, if you feel like there's too much stuff in between you and him, if you have shook your fist at him in the past, you've been angry, you don't understand, you have blamed him from things, you have pushed him away, you're divided from him. And your invitation today is to be reunited. This is the invitation of the gospel, and it only comes through one way that you would believe, that you would profess, that you would say, Jesus, I need you, the one, to come into my life and to change me, to save me. The Bible says that if we pray that way, and maybe you're watching online today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is your day. You are his one, and he's focused on you in this moment. He says to you today is the day of salvation. Would you trust him today? Would you put your hope and your faith in the only one who can save you? in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we would pray, say, God, I'm sorry for the sin in my heart that I've gone against you. Today, I choose to put my faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sin. God, would you help me as I turn and live according to your word? The Bible says that in that moment that you would be safe. Now, here's the beautiful thing from there is you need to be united with other believers. You need to be connected in relationship. We should be growing in the Lord together. If that's you today, let us pray with you. Let us help you. Let us encourage you and support you. I want to pray for the rest of us who are here in the room. If this is your church family, you are a part of a church that loves one another. We love God here. We try to do our best to, to honor each other, to serve each other. If you're a guest with us, you're welcome to be a part of that. But I want to make this clear. This isn't about City Church. This isn't about our church at all. This is about the church. And here's what I'm convinced of. If, if you and I were just a sliver of a small group of the believers who are in this city, who are in this demographic, there are great churches meeting all over right now. In just a moment, we're going to pray for those churches. We're going to pray for those pastors because we are one church and we are united together. We are one group, one group of believers, not united under some branded name, not under some denomination, only under the name of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to pray together. We're going to be united together. So I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet today. And I want to do something that's just slightly different, okay? It might require you to get outside of your comfort zone. For the last few years, we've been divided. We've been disconnected. And so I just want to do something as a spiritual, practical, both exercise. Reach out and touch the person next to you. Find a way to connect with them. Touch them on the shoulder or something. Don't leave any gaps. Don't leave any gaps. You can be a guest here today. I understand this might be different for you. It's okay. We're just going to pray. And I just want to show the picture. This is what the body of Christ looks like. You're connected to each other physically, but spiritually even deeper. This is the importance of loving each other, supporting each other, and being united with another group of believers. What would it look like for us to begin to show Jesus to the world just like this? This is what changes that you and I would stand united. Heavenly Father, unite us, not under the name of City Church, but under the church. We are one church. God, help us as we stand as one. Unite us together. Meet all of the needs that might be here in the house, whether they're health needs or financial needs. Let your miracles flow into the hearts of those who need it today through your church. We are one church under an all-powerful God. And God, I ask, we believe, we stand on your word that we have one united mission to reach all people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you help us to do that as we bring you glory that others might see you as we're reunited, that your love might be ignited. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.